episode 419 of Control Talk Now, where we talk about all things HVAC and smart building controls, including sales and marketing. What is up? I'm so glad to be here today. We've got a great, great show. We've got a fantastic guest, Julie Patron, head of marketing at ABB, is going to be stopping by later to talk to us about what's up with ABB and artificial intelligence and all kinds of cool stuff. I also have a very special new segment that you're going to want to check out. Hey, but before we get to the show, let's have a word from our sponsor this week, ABB. So ABB is such a cool company, man. They have so many different products and different product offerings. And most of us own for variable frequency drives. At least I did. They do a lot of metering, a lot of cool stuff. And obviously, obviously the building AI is a really cool product as well. I had a chance to meet Julie Patron and some of her team at Rokai Miami Con. Good folks. Be sure to check it out. All right, so there you go, man. We're getting ready to hit third quarter. I don't know what you're thinking marketing budget-wise, but if you've got a new product launch or maybe you just want to give your brand a little bit of a boost, Control Trends has all kinds of great marketing opportunities now. Whether or not it's sponsoring a commercial, sponsoring one of our newsletters, we're running some banner ads. We've got all kinds of packages that sort of fit any budget. Uh, if you've got the products, I got the platform. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Let's talk. Well, I don't know how your 4th of July weekend was, but I made a new friend over the weekend and she knows all about marketing. She's one of the best kept secrets in our industry. Her name is Danielle Radden. She has a cool website called Talking Walls and she knows all about marketing. And I get so many questions on marketing I can't answer. So Danielle has agreed to come help me answer some of these questions from our community. But before we get to the question of the day, Danielle, how about telling our audience a little bit about who you are? And how did you get to be so good at marketing? Sure. Uh, so I'm Danielle Radden. Uh, I actually got a master's in biochemistry. So naturally, I ended up in marketing. We'll just <laughs> nice. leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a uh, lot of sense. Yeah. Well, so I I use a lot of that science background to treat marketing like experiments. So if you think about marketing is always evolving, all we can do is observe and then adjust. So I set up all of my marketing campaigns based on that principle that we see what works well and we adjust from there. And it's really just about observing the market, observing the people and trying to understand what they need, what they want. Tell us about your business first too. So people know how to get a hold of you. We got, we got to know about, we got to know about talking walls. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I noticed that there was a little bit of a gap in our industry and there's not a whole lot of marketers filling this gap. So I started talking walls marketing as a way to bring in some expertise into marketing specifically for this industry. It's, it's so different from everything else. All right. So we've got a marketing question. People keep asking me this question and I'm hoping, I am absolutely hoping you can come up with an answer because it's got a lot of people on edge. So with the advent of AI, artificial intelligence, the question is, how is that going to affect most people's marketing in this industry? I mean, I played with it a little bit. What about you? Have you played with it? Yes, totally. So, so what have you done with it? What have you used with it? Uh, usually I use it to get ideas and okay. I, I treat it like a conversation though. Uh, I'll go into chat GPT and I'll, I, I mean, a very blunt and non-human conversation. I tell it things that I would never tell a <laughs> real person. It's kind of uh, great. You don't have to worry about being politically <laughs> right. correct or anything, right? You can just say, hey. <laughs> yep. You can say, I didn't like that. Tell me again. Tell me again. Yeah. Way. Yeah. Yep. It's like it's like the best assistant ever, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I mean, give me an example of how you might use it for a brainstorming idea. Yeah. So let's say I want to write a post about... The use of AI in your smart building marketing technology. Uh, I would put that into chat GPT and say, write me 20 headers that I could use to, to write a good social media hook. And it would come up with 20 different headers. And then I would pick one of them and I'd say, rewrite this as if it was written in the 1920s or as if it was written in the 1960s, or I would give it a specific word. I'd say, I need you to create an analogy to cars uh, using yeah. this header. Um, and I do that a number of times. And I, I try to just branch out as much as possible because the ability of that system is limitless. But it doesn't come up with those things on its own. It it needs you to 
guide it and prompt it and give it some yeah, direction. I think part what's sort of freaking the marketing people out a little bit is they're going, well, if it can do that, give me a good hook and then write a post or write a campaign or whatever. What do they need me for? Right. I mean, so in your experience, your marketing experience, does it differentiate at all? Or is it just like, you know, generic, beautiful, generic gobbledygook? Is it kind of like the color beige, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, honestly, there's two parts to that. And you, you said it specific that it gives you the polite, generic answer. So if you're not creative enough to say, no, I don't want polite and generic. I want creative and stand out and I want to make a big wave, then you're always going to have the polite, generic answer. And everybody's going to have that answer. Every marketing person I've talked to, when you get back to your marketing, your goal, your ultimate goal, I think, is you want to stand out in the right ways. I guess one of my concerns might be that, well, if my marketing, even if it's really good, sounds like everybody else is, am I really being effective at marketing? Right. So I always go back to the point of marketing is to have the right, get the right message to the right people at the right time. And really what I'm seeing AI tools and technologies helping with is getting a message. Is it the right message? I don't know. Is it the right people? I don't know. Right time? I don't know. So there still needs to be that person to go through and do all those other other checks to make sure that this marketing is working. Yeah, absolutely. That is such a great distinction. But your advice to marketing people, just shun AI and Put your head in the sand and hope it goes away or embrace it. Uh, embrace it. Unless you are still writing on a typewriter and going old school <laughs> marketing, then you better be using some AI tools. Good news, bad news for the marketing professionals out there. Good news is your job is going to be easier. Uh, I was reading a post the other day that 60% of the basic, just menial tasks can be offloaded onto AI. So as a marketing person, offload whatever you can to make your job easier and to elevate the skills that you really care about. Uh, bad news is over dependence on AI tools is going to detract from your brand. Awesome. Well, Danielle, thank you so much. How do people get hold of you if they want to learn more about what you do? Yeah, you can visit me at TalkingWallsMarketing.com or email me at Danielle at TalkingWallsMarketing.com. Very, very good. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, I'll probably have another question next week. Will you come back and can we make this a regular thing? I kind of like you. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Chris Tomquist here with a very new, very wonderful friend. You have probably seen her on LinkedIn. I mean, if you've been in the industry a while, you know who she is. Her name is Julie Patron. Julie, thanks for taking some minutes to come. Thanks for taking some time to come talk with us. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You bet, you bet. Well, you bet, you've been around the controls block a few times, right? So walk us through your journey, if you would. Hey. Sure, absolutely. Uh, it did not start out in building automation controls, IoT at all. Uh, I was a copywriter right out of college in San Francisco for a large uh, advertising agency. I, I did copy for Clorox and Levi Strauss and Taco Bell. And uh, I did have one account, National Semiconductor, where uh, I edited and wrote uh, what then was called their national anthem. Wow. Uh, so kind of my first my first introduction, of course, that was chips and semiconductors. Yes. But, um, you know, who knew it sort of, uh, you know, laid the framework here. Um, fast well, forward. Hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I got to talk to you about copywriting because that is a passion of mine since oh. I sort of stepped away from the business. I've studied with every copywriter I could. Good. I think it's probably one of the most uh, important skills anybody can have, right? I mean, yeah. all marketing or all sales comes down to copy, right? Because you got to have the right words. So let's talk a little bit more about your copywriting experience and, and maybe oh. some tips you could offer <laughs> offer our audience. Because I, I am just so pumped. I knew, didn't know that about you. Yeah, about the yes. Yeah, that's that's where I started um, and was very lucky. I actually, I have my master's degree uh, in journalism as one of my master's <sighs> degrees. And so I... Um, ironically wanted to be a travel writer is really what I wanted to be. Okay. And every day walking in to be a copywriter, I walked past the doors of travel, uh, Condé Nast Traveler magazine, never applied. But, um, you know, I think it, it, it's for me, 
um, being a copywriter, loving to write still to this day. I write a lot, obviously, for uh, my current position. Um, I I need to know the product. I, I have to understand the technology around it. And I work with some of the most brilliant engineers and people that take the time to explain, uh, explain it to me, uh, you know, what this, what this product or what this means within this industry. And I am then better able to explain it to, to others that way. Um, You know, I, I don't know if I necessarily have tips other than just keep doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, I write, I rewrite, I rewrite. I usually write in my head about 3 a.m. I wake up and that's nice. when and and uh it, it's one of those when the mood strikes is when you just start to write. But um well yeah but yeah. you know and, and what you what Jules what I really want to emphasize is just the importance of it, right? Because you know if you think about our industry, I mean you you know you gotta have a great product, but man, we can walk around the the realcom show, Ibicon show, I mean they're all those companies have great products. So if you don't right. have a great product, right. you're not in the game. Right. You have to have great pricing, great customer support, but you got all these people that do. So one of my anthems is, you know, so what makes the difference? And I think what makes the difference is the messaging. And, you know, the thing about copywriting, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, what I've learned about it is really them, I and there are a couple of rules. You know, you got the rule of one, one big idea, but then how you communicate that, the words you choose, I mean, it is both a science and an art. It's 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 very pointed in the sense where sometimes I'm talking to a system integrator, sometimes a facility uh, manager, sometimes an end user, a building owner, and that messaging and those conversations are all vastly different in importance. And I have to be really aware and, and really keen on on which audience I I want to speak to Smart. and why. Yes. And um. And, you know, that's always very important. And so if you were to see my secret sauce that I have in my computer here for ABB, um, you know, I've got a long list of value propositions and what, why anything matters to each group that I'm speaking to. I need to know the why behind why they're making decisions. It's nice. not just about how I word it. It's what's important to them, because I'll agree with you on the messaging. I also agree with you. It's the relationship. I tend to think about what what matters to you, um, what matters to a building owner versus what matters to ABB are, are vastly different, right? Yes. So I'm working for Technically, you know, even though I work for ABB, I'm really always thinking about the other guy. Why is something important to them? And then to message around that very thoughtfully and very carefully. Oh, I love that. That's yeah. such wise wisdom, Julie. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down and put it on a plaque <laughs> because again, you know, one of my uh, things, you know, coming up through the industry, and I've been in it for a long time, is I tended to think about things in terms of what I thought the product, you know presented mm-hmm. or whatever. And, and to your point, you really have to understand your customers why. And, yes. and, and, uh, so brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Okay. All right. So anyway, I interrupted you. I sidetracked <laughs> no. you. We so, left from copywriting. <laughs> What's the next part of the journey? Well, there was, there was some ins and outs of the journey I actually published a magazine for quite some time. And then fell into um, a, a company, a, a, a protocols, a standards company, the Zigbee Alliance. So uh, was my first, um, really my first introduction to the IOT. And um, starting with Zigbee, man, I was like a deer in the headlights. I, you know, I'm like an 802.154. What? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And, and so it was, it, again, working with brilliant engineers. And of course, the way the Zigbee Alliance, which is now, you know, uh, uh, this Connectivity Standards Alliance, um, it, you know, they bring in these, again, really intelligent engineers from from large companies, whether it's Signify or Amazon, Google, whomever. And then I'm working with them as they build standards. So I'm not only marketing the the standards and the protocols and the products that are being developed off of that, but the Zigbee Alliance proper as well. So I thought I knew everything because I knew BACnet from that. And uh, and so I my really my interest fell sort of into in two arenas there at Zigbee. One was buildings. I was fascinated with buildings, and the other one was energy energy management. Um, and was recruited then by uh, a company called Cylon, Cylon Controls, Cylon mm-hmm. Automatrix, out of Dublin, Ireland. 
And my my job there was global marketing director. And that was really to bring uh, Cylon Controls that was in Dublin, Cylon Automatrix. They had purchased the old American Automatrix um, company. And then they had uh, Teletrol, which was Cylon Multi-Site Retail that they had purchased. And to bring all of those under, under one umbrella and market those to the U.S. and globally. Um, from that, we were shortly there. Well, I guess I was doing that for about three years. And then we were acquired by ABB. Um, and that's been three years now that we were, I, I can't believe I say that, it just flew by, but we were acquired three years ago last March by ABB and um, and have now been responsible for the, the, the marketing strategy and the planning for uh, the United States, for Latin America, and I work with Canada as well. Oh, very cool. All yeah. right, well, Jules, I, I got to ask, you know, because ABB, I think most people just think of ABB as the variable frequency drives. I know I do for the most part, but what does ABB do? So it, it, it's, I'm going to kind of give you somewhat of a canned a little bit, but ABB, it's a, it's a leading global technology company uh, that, that energizes the transformation of society and industry to achieve a more productive, sustainable future. Um, there's certain pillars. So p th there's, uh, there's robotics is is a vertical with ABB. There's motion. There's electrification, which is where I sit within buildings. And then there's process automation. So ABB is um is sits in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. It again global company with about a hundred and fifty thousand employees currently, of which about 19, between 18 and 19,000 of those are in the United States. Um, and currently ABB, I guess. Over the last 10 years or so, they've invested about $14 billion within the United States um, for operational improvements, state-of-the-art equipment, new facilities, products, and people like me. Nice, nice. Well, it seems like you landed in a, a, a company that might be big oh. enough to handle your capabilities, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, your mouth to God's ears. But, yes. <laughs> but I, um, where I did land is in a place where I absolutely love what I do. I love my job. I adore the people I work with, and I learn something new every day. Well, Every you, know, day, you can't you can't ask for more than that with no. a career, can you? No, so for not sure. at all. Not at all. Well, you no, know, Julie, you've been around the industry for a while. I mean, I love the fact that you seem like, you know, one of your traits is you're very curious and you're not afraid to ask questions. And uh, so what what have you what have you seen trend wise changing? I mean, we got AI, we got sustainability. I mean, talk to me about what what are you seeing in those domains, yeah. for example? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Yes, we have both. It's sustainability. I, it's funny actually, um, at the show, at the Ibicon show last week, I was talking to some people and we were trying to come up with new buzzwords, uh, because you, you hear ESG and sustainability and AI so often. But, um, it, what I have, have learned is, of course, especially in the U.S., I think, I believe sustainability globally started a little bit earlier than us. Yeah. Um, and and in the U.S., right, it's no longer a dangling carrot. It's a big stick. And uh, municipalities and federal government, they are you have to you have to become more sustainable and you have to, you know, implement sustainability ESG, you know, uh, protocols within especially within buildings. And um, and so I'm seeing I'm seeing quite a bit of that. What I'm also seeing is it really varies by region and by state within the United States. Classic example is some of my um, partners in Colorado uh, talk to me about they are electrify Denver. So everything has to be electrification. And um and so that's very interesting where I look at my uh, some of my integrators in the Florida area are, you know, it's really about metering and water. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just it's vastly different um, in, in each region, which, again, as a marketer, makes me start to think about, OK, how am I going to talk to each of these now? <laughs> like, what right, am I going to do right, differently right. for each of them? But um you know, no, no matter what the, the, as we, as we all know and hear over and over the, the high percentage of, uh, energy waste within buildings, um, is, is they are the largest 
energy waster, if you will. So, um, so for me, again, we talk about, I sit on our ABB has a sustainability council. I sit on that. Um, and, and it's just about how we can come together one wholly as the company and what we're doing, uh, you know, with our agreements, uh, by 2030 to make ABB better, but also, how can I help again promote our our channel partners, our integrators, our building owners and users, um, so that they have a better uh, use experience within a, the built environment, whether it's occupancy or whether it's uh, uh, saving money within that building. You think about our industry and the opportunity to really make a huge right. difference with you know the the carbon footprint and everything else, and it's uh, uh, we just got to get more people in. I just. Why would you want to? Why would you want to go someplace else when you got this great industry to work I, in? Right. I, I agree, and I think just not enough people understand or recognize that. You know, I I, I uh, talk to people all day long that are not within our industry, but they have no idea that you know whether it's lighting or HVAC or shading, uh, how a building wastes uh, yeah. that much energy. They have no clue, and they wouldn't really think about it. But just a simple light bulb that burns hot you know, is, is maybe not necessary uh, in the summertime when it's already hot outside, at least I'm in California, so it's warm. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's education. I think that we need to, as, as industry professionals, continue to educate uh, even outside of our industry a little bit, just, yeah. just t teach people. Now you've got the, the, I sound like an old woman, the younger groups, you know, the, the younger crowd that they understand. Um, and they are holding themselves, I think, a little more culpable than perhaps my generation did. Uh, but, um, I still think that there's a lot of people that just don't don't understand and don't recognize. So education is important for us. Well, I keep trying to get Matthew McConaughey to come on the podcast. You know, he's, cause he's a big spokesman. You know, you've heard this whole thing, team earth with us. Yes. Salesforce, yeah. which is such a great brand and branding and all. And I think he'd be a great, if I get him on the podcast, I think a bunch of people would become more aware of the, um, you know, our industry and, and the role we play on Team Earth. We are really like the most right. valuable industry on Team Earth, in my right. opinion. And, yeah. and so do you know him? Uh, uh, I, I don't, but I, I don't. What about what about Elon Musk? I keep trying to get him to come on the podcast. I, I'd be happy to be your co-host for either of those. Yes, yes, you you count. I'll count you in. Please I will, do. I, I will count. I will count you in. So, uh, no, no, but 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 it, it but it is fascinating. So you're trying to come up with a, as copywriters, we're trying to think of another word for uh, yes. sustainability. Yes. How about how about carbon busters? And we could like like superheroes oh, and stuff like that. That's or, cute. Uh, yeah, you know, I, you're, you're right. Sustainability is just too generic, right? Well, it's 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 getting old like the term smart building i think you know i yeah. mean then we go to intelligent building then we say the built environment and i i mean there's this we just need to come up with some new language i think that well, interests people you know what's funny is that you know i think those terms cycle because when i when i was in the industry the first when the you know energy management was the buzzword then everybody got tired of that but it seems like energy management is making a return i mean it is kind of concise and to the point right so it is uh, and it it, it it is what it is. I never like yeah. that phrase, but that is what we are doing is yeah. managing energy within, especially within buildings. Yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. And yeah. so much more, right? Because we, you know, we do, we, we're doing so much more because obviously one of the, um, the things you alluded to earlier was, you know, with sustainability and ESG mm -hmm. issues, it, you know, it's kind of on the building owners now to collect the data and report Yes. Sort of what's going on. I don't know whether you caught it or not. Lauren Scott had this from Distech has this podcast called the resilience report. And, and she came up with two terms I'd never heard of before. You probably know about them. Greenwashing and green hushing. Have you heard these terms? I have. Yes. Yes. I mean, it just blew me away to think about the fact that you got some people that are just ringing the bell. We're doing all this, right? Saying they're saving energy when they're not. And then you got the people right. that are saving it that are afraid to say anything right. about them. It's just, it's, 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 it's an interesting concept, but I think that it does sort of put us as an industry sort of in uh, the sweet spot to help building owners in terms right. of being able to provide the, provide the data to actually show what they are doing. One of the things that I've collected um, that anybody can do, it's, it's a it's a significant amount of work, but what I'm also hearing from um, let's take schools, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, with the um, 
with the Biden Act, the schools received so much money that they could retrofit and update uh, buildings that, you know, for energy management. Uh, what I'm hearing is the facility managers within these schools just don't know where to get the money, how to oh. how to find the money. They know it's there. They know they have a certain amount, but what do they do? So mm-hmm. I put together a database, which is ever changing. It's probably a week later. It's probably old um, for every state of how people can access uh, these funds and and what they need to do and when the when expiration. So whether it's federal funding, um, whether it's loans, whether it's you know, it's it's different from each state. So I have federal and then I have also, uh, again, by states, by regions. Um just just to help support these people because again back to education i'm not really sure we know the funding is out there to support these buildings but i'm not really entirely sure everybody knows how to access that money how would, I, I started to laugh originally because it seemed like that was you know play right out of the government politicians playbook <laughs> 101 right which is we're offering all this money but we're not going to tell anybody how to get it right yeah, so, exactly uh, well, well if, if you actually had some people that have You've talked to that have actually been able to access those funds. Uh, yes, they can, and 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 I actually have given it to our sales team so that they can then support, uh, you know, system integrators and end users because I, I just didn't realize that something that simple isn't that simple. You know, okay. Julie, that's great. I know how much work that is. I mean, would you be willing to to share that with the Control Trends community? Could we put Absolutely. a link or something? Oh, Absolutely. perfect, perfect, yep. perfect. We probably need to see if we can get some people on board that would be willing to help you sort of keep that up. It seems like that would be something that uh, two or three of the key manufacturers would want to work with you on because it's sure. obviously good for the entire industry if people have money to spend, right? Absolutely. And um, I, 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 between you and me and everybody listening, uh, you know, there was a point where I realized it was so much, there's so much money and so many links that I started enlisting uh, Chat GPT. Ah. <laughs> so, Help. Nice. How, how did it do? How did it do? It with did that? pretty well. It, yeah. it did pretty well. Some of it was redundant, but then again, I think some of it probably is. You know, you could get the same for every state. It's just by state, but gotcha. it, it it sped up the process. Well, cool. Well, you mentioned Chat BT, so let, let's cycle around to artificial intelligence because, man, that is just. I mean, just within the last year, has exploded as near sure. as I can tell. So, sure. what, what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence and vis a vis smart buildings and vis a vis ABB? As as buildings age, um, they start to age out, and we need to focus more and more on um, on the smart technology. Uh, so AI, uh, ABB offers something called efficiency AI, um, and it, it's proprietary software that you can install. You can install it in new construction, but it works it works well within retrofits. So any retrofitted building, and, and what the AI does is it it's um, it, it sort of sweeps through, and every five minutes it analyzes energy uh, energy use within your building. So if there's an area that needs changing or updating, tweaking, if you will, uh, the AI information will put well, the AI will pull the data and then give you back that information on what needs. Needs to be changed. Um, Very cool. So, uh, you know, again, with AI, it, it people people really, I think, still there's there's so many. We just hear that word thrown around so often, and and you hear good, bad, right, or wrong. But I think it's probably with using utilizing AI within a building. It's probably one of the most simplest ways to optimize energy consumption. Um, it it pulls that data rapidly. It has um, a, a quick return on investment, a quick positive impact, uh, which ultimately not only then helps the building, but then comes back to the environment that we were talking about, right? So, yeah. so yeah. it's it's a really quick, uh, effective way. And what I really like about our efficiency AI product is um, currently at uh, us, along with every one of my uh, industry colleagues, offers um, most of their products have predictive maintenance, right? So you can right. be, use some software, you're on the golf course, and somebody says something's something's going to break soon, fix it. Um, with AI, it again starts to self-correct. So because it's polling and checking this data every five minutes, it ultimately will self-correct what's going on within that building. Oh, so wow. no wow. longer is there the need for, you know, I'm, uh, you know, the 
the last minute predictive maintenance. It just sort of washes that out. Well, um, you know, Jules, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting because what I hear you saying is, I mean, you know, typically, as you know, new construction, the control system goes in, the test and balances guy come in or people sure. come in, they adjust everything. And then, hey, the building is optimal for about an hour and 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> but, right. But, but what true. I what, what what I hear you sort of saying embedded in there, it's almost like it's a continuous commissioning. Right. I mean, Correct. you start to come out of. Yeah. So, OK, yeah. cool. Yeah. So, so, you know, again, it's one of the easiest retrofits. Um, it works on top of any backnet, current backnet, uh, HVA okay. system, minimal investment and, and immediately, you know, up to 25%, uh, savings. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, and, 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 and so it's, it's again, it's it's very autonomous. It's compliant with uh, with ASHRAE, the CDC guidelines. Um, so so it's really kind of a it's a cool product uh, that I hope we see more people utilizing um, it, soon, because I, I think it's one of the best ways, again, that you can pull data and and you can choose your data points. Right. You maybe I, I don't know anybody that only wants one data point, but you can yeah. you can you can pull your points and decide what right. it is, what's important to you and what's in that building. That's most important. So, no, it sounds cool, Jules. And you guys, I mean, I know you do a lot around controls, but to my knowledge, you don't have a building automation system per se, vis-a-vis -a -vis a Tritium or Niagara or whatever. You work with those systems, correct? Correct. We have uh, our Integra, which is a uh, Tritium Jace. Yeah. Our okay. Integra, I get yeah, you. The, yeah. Okay. So is this, is the efficiency AI, is it just a piece of software or is it's it a piece software. of software? It's software. Okay. It is, software. It, it's, it's a software. And we worked in conjunction with a company called Brainbox AI out yeah. of Toronto. Yeah. I know Brainbox. Yeah. So yeah, we, um, we invested, uh, we invested, ABB invested within Brainbox, that, um, that company. And then we collaborated with them to come up with our efficiency AI. So, um, so I'm assuming it's, it's a fairly easy installation. So my, my guess easy. is, if, yeah. is if a, if a building owner out there that hears this and is interested, or if a integrator that has customers that think they might be interested in it, um, you, you simply just get the software. I'm sure you just load it on the front end, correct? That's correct. Yeah, it's a SaaS model, um, and you know, again, it's it's by uh, square footage based on the building and based okay. on the needs. But um, the installation is quite simple. We work in conjunction still with Brainbox. They help support uh, okay. the installation within the building. Um, and and what we really do is even before we install, we take a look at that building and um, you know meter the building. And, and understand where there is uh, energy waste and then set up a program specifically for that building. So, very, very, very yeah. cool. That's, that's awesome. And so people get hold of just what abb.com to find out more about that product or and it's, it's the, a new abb.com. Uh, new abb.com. Yeah. Okay, so but it's new.abb.com. Um, correct. Okay. Uh, you can also just, uh, you know, look for uh, uh, abb efficiency AI. Uh, I'm yeah. sure it would pop up, um, and that'll. Well, that'll what, I'll, I'll, I'll put well. I'll put some links in the show notes so okay, people great. can just click right there. Yeah, absolutely, we'll, we'll, that's we'll, great. We'll get that, done. Yeah. that is that is so cool, Julie. Yeah. That, is, that that's that's really awesome. Well, you know, to your point, it seems like using you know things like AI and machine learning and all the technology we already have in place because now we can ac access the da data very easily, right? Correct. With things like haystack tagging, brick, whatever. So. It seems like there's just a lot of low hanging fruit for these real estate people to be able to really chomp into their carbon footprint and everything else. I, I believe so. And again, I believe that utilizing AI is one of the fastest, most um, efficient ways to manage your energy, to again, pull the data, see where there's waste, return on your investment. And again, uh, you know, I, I always, take it back to then there's occupancy comfort right so if you you keep occupants in your building longer if people are happier if it's you know an even killed 72 degrees in your building with no moisture uh, yeah. the lighting is perfect i mean you're going to keep these people longer which again helps save money ultimately for you in that yeah. building you know it does yeah. seem like that's such a challenge for the real estate folks after yeah. covid where everybody used to working from home because the younger people want to work from home anyway right just getting them to come back to the building and i think one of the ways to do that is just to have the building experience be nicer than your home experience or <laughs> right so. i i really think it's going to have to be and i i believe the 
again, that that's specifically here. Uh, you're you're feeding a lot of birds with one crumb is the way yeah. I always say this, because, like again, that. you're you're saving energy, excuse me, saving energy, money and energy. Your, uh, your occupants are happy. You have a better working environment and ultimately people will want to come. Back. You don't want to, I guess, force people to come back. You want to make the environment such that, um, that people want to be there. People want to be together yeah. and to collaborate and to collaborate in a, in a building where they feel safe and happy. Yeah. That makes so much. Yeah. Did you see or talk to the guy at, at Realcom Ibicon? He was like a Hollywood set designer. He's like, he was, I mean, he's like the guy from uh, Back to the Future, the mad scientist or whatever. But his whole gig, he was the guy who did like the 3D boxes and all that. Did you I saw missed the people? him. No. Oh, he was so cool, Jules. But what he was telling me was that companies have him come in and design environments. He was showing me some pictures, right, of it. It's, it's like being inside a 3D game, right? I mean, so people are, to, to our point, you know, real estate owners are investing in this so that people want to come in because it's the coolest building, it's the coolest experience. So, you know, imagine going to your office and it's like being in the middle of a video game or something like that. Yeah, right? it was, wow, that's cool. It was, it was cool. It was really, really cool. <laughs> that's the way to get the the younger kids back. You know, I mean, I yeah. I, I, uh, the, I shouldn't call them younger kids again. I but but you know, I think that younger age group has so much to offer, and and I, I think. Again, when you have somebody that's starting that's brilliant and is working from home, they really miss out on that collaboration. That yeah. old, I, I, I again at Ibicon, I laughed because um, the water cooler was in the back of the room and oh, there was yes. this huge group of people standing around. And I was like, oh, it's like water cooler talk. And you like, I haven't yeah. seen that for years, but, but just to be able to, to, you accomplish so much more when you're in the building with people working together, I think, than right. like continually, uh, you know, meetings and calls that we have right. all day long. Well, you get those yeah. chance encounters. I think it was Steve Jobs. I think Google copied it from him. You know, he deliberately designed the building so that people from different departments would have to intersect at the water yeah. cooler or whatever. Yeah. So that's uh, brilliant. Yeah. I think there's a, there's, there, there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. anything else you see really cool at Realcom Ibicon that sort of caught your attention? No, you know, it was just, it was, it was, um, there were some really great people. We'll talk to a lot of very interesting people. Yeah, me um, too. You know, this just building owners. We had everybody from uh, Rockefeller, you know, down to colleges. Uh, it just was, I just really enjoyed the show quite a bit. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm looking forward to next year and and just getting to uh, really chat with people uh, was, was really good for me. Just having some long, good conversations, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Jules, anything else before we wrap it up? No, I've really enjoyed this, though. Thank Me you. Me too. It was, yeah. it was absolutely great. All right. Well, there you go. That's my guest, Julie Patron. I will put links in the show note. Follow her on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're looking to save some energy and get your building under control, remember the Efficiency AI product that comes from ABP. And Jules, got to come back some other time. We got to oh, do this more love often. love to. Yeah. Thanks so much, Eric. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, there you go. That's another week on Control Talk. Now your Smart Buildings video cast and podcast. If you haven't signed up already, sign up for the Control Trends Smart Briefing. So it's a weekly newsletter that I send out that covers the highlights of the week, plus some other useful, interesting control news you can use. With that, be bold, stay in control, stay relevant. As Hunter Thompson used to say, buy the ticket, take the ride. And as Kenny Smyers used to say,